Well, of course, I just owe almost everything to my own father. I really do. He brought me up um, to believe all the things that I do believe, and they're just the values on which I fought the election. And it's passionately interesting to me that the things which I learned in a small town, in a very modest home, are just the things which I believe have won the election. Gentlemen, you're very kind. Prime Minister, there's a lot of international go? interest. I've discovered in looking at women politicians that the relationship between father and daughter is absolutely critical. Whether it's Mrs. Gandhi, Benazir Bhutto, uh, Margaret Thatcher herself, me, Barbara Castle, the same thing is true over and over again. It's the, the father's influence in believing his daughter can achieve almost anything that is all important. During her first two years in office, Mrs. Thatcher's ratings slumped. In pushing forward her programme for economic reform, she provoked hostility within her own party as well as in the country. But when she addressed the Tory party conference in October 1980 and announced herself not for turning, she projected an image of one who would not shrink in the face of criticism nor broker dissent. It made uncomfortable listening for some among her colleagues. Mr Chairman, this government is pursuing the only policy which gives any hope of bringing our people back to real and lasting employment. If the country had been unsure of Maggie, all this would change in 1982 with the Falklands War. Success in the South Atlantic boosted Mrs. Thatcher's ratings and greatly enhanced her chance of winning a second term in office the following year. And when the election was announced, she took to campaigning with her characteristic zeal. Just think of a tornado. It kind of sweeps into town. Everything is all tossed up and down, and then it sweeps out again. And you can see exactly where it's been. Uh, it was always a bit like that. Uh, she was amazing. She was a great campaigner. And she would do almost anything she was asked to do. She didn't stand on dignity. So, yes, you know, have you ever held a calf before, Mrs Thatcher? She would hold a calf with a sort of wary look at the back end. Um, would you like to do a bit of brushing and be a, you know, sweep her new brooms and all the rest of it? Certainly she'd be happy to do that. Uh, she was liable to wander around picking up litter at the same time. And it was all good stuff. This was against the background of a gov government of, in previous generations that had been mostly old men, rather stuffy types, who would say, well, you know, you know if there's a camera over there, I see. Uh, and that was both Labour and Tories. Margaret came in, female, youngish, keen, technocrat, if you like, and uh, very well indeed to do whatever the cameras wanted to make her point. And it worked. Either we carry on under a Conservative government with an approach which tries to tackle our long-term problems and is succeeding, or else we go to the alternative. And the alternative, which would be a Labour government, consists of the most extreme programme I have ever seen laid before a British electorate. Mrs Thatcher's appeal now stretched beyond the traditional Tory heartlands into the homes and workplaces of the working class. For a woman of your word, that's no inquisition. By gum laugh, you'll stick to your decision. I get a bit bored with the work that I do, but Maggie lass, I wouldn't swap you. <laughs> the funniest occasion was when she went to the Pallion shipyard, when it was still was a shipyard in Sunderland. They didn't seem to be doing much work, but there were a lot of them around. And Mrs. Thatcher went in search of shipyard workers. And these shipyard, uh, this was absolutely comic. These shipyard workers disappeared at the sight of this woman striding purposefully towards them. She literally disappeared, went into all kinds of nooks and crannies and whatever. And eventually she caught up with some. And she started bantering with them. Before you knew where you were, they had a great audience. And they all loved it. Four years later, during the general election campaign of 1987, it was the same. Mrs Thatcher's boundless energy impressing the voters while exhausting her team and the press pack she had in tow. That's very nice. The important thing is, finish strong. The long distance runner knows he finishes strong. Pace yourself to finish strong. And of course now she gets the applause of her supporters as she has done. This is the third time Mr. Tebbit to meet her at the door and a wave. The campaign worked. 
Margaret Thatcher was elected for a third term. Now, we were told that our campaign was not sufficiently slick. I regard that as a compliment. We are not a slick party. We are a party that brings sound policies, stable policies, and security to our country. Now, eight years in office, she'd grown in political and personal stature. She'd led the nation to victory in war, was dominant on the world stage, and at home she'd crushed the unions and reformed the economy. And by now, all this was reflected in her style of presentation and of dress. In the first years, there were a lot of floppy bows and polyester or silk dresses. A, a bit girlish, actually a bit young for her, because she was well into her 50s at that stage. But by the time she was tipping over into 60s, she was looking regal, more regal than the Queen. And I'm sure that was intentional. I shall never forget uh, the television pictures of her arriving in Moscow at the end of March uh, 1987. And there was an election coming. I didn't know when, neither did the officials, but we knew there was one coming. And she emerged from the VC tent looking like something out of Dr. Zhivago. Her hat, you know, eyes glistening, this sort of thing. Oh, terrific. I mean, she was, she, she was a star in many respects. Margaret Thatcher paid close attention to her clothes. She felt strongly that the impression she gave had to be right for the political occasion. On foreign visits, for example, Mrs. Thatcher would look to the colour of the national flag and local customs when deciding what to wear. She was very, very sensitive of the places she was going to. And like the Queen, who quite often would have things embroidered with a national flower, um, if she was going to Canada, for example, um, Mrs. Thatcher would similarly sort of find out what was the most appropriate colour. And I think um, particularly once when she was on a visit to Poland, she chose green because she'd been told by a Polish acquaintance that green was a very favoured and important colour in Poland. Mrs. Thatcher also believed people liked their leaders to look businesslike and well turned out. I think it would have been very difficult for her not to have that kind of aura of being smartly dressed because no matter what happened, she was always Prime Minister. And, you know, it was always an occasion. She couldn't sort of say, oh, well, I'm just having tea and a scone with Dennis and I'm an ordinary, you know, I'm Mrs. Thatcher, I'm an ordinary housewife, because she wasn't. And she was always on duty. She was always very aware of the camera. And I think that's important, you know, that that was her image and that was her... That was her life role. 